Let's bring in our latest exclusive from Syria. Our team there is charting the endgame of the Islamic State group. Part of that concerns the fate of the people who came from abroad to join the so-called jihad. Our reporters have been speaking to French citizens who became caught up in the murderous regime. Their regrets perhaps now showing their initial decision was, at best, naive. Civilians continue to pour out of the Islamic State's collapsing caliphate. They are fleeing the fighting, the bombing and the hunger. Amongst these women, a number of jihadi brides who travelled from all over the world to live under the Sharia. This woman is French. She says her name is Mathilde, that she has no children and that she lived in the French city of Tours before travelling to Syria four years ago. What do you hope is going to happen now? <laughs> Are you sad that it's over? No, no, no. Ça fait longtemps que j'essaie de partir d'ici, mais sans argent, sans connaissance, c'est pas possible. Mathilde says there is still a number of French nationals inside what's left of the so-called caliphate. James Andre, Romeo Longois and Maïsa Awad, our team there reporting on the ground in Syria. Next, Europe's Human Rights Court has denied a request by the German humanitarian's Sea Watch to disembark 47 migrants stuck on a rescue ship off Sicily. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, however, requested in its decision that Italy take all necessary measures as soon as possible to provide those migrants with adequate medical care, food, water and basic supplies. And it said the 15 unaccompanied minors on the boat should receive legal guardianship. Those foreign fighters, the ones who in the heady days when ISIS controlled vast swathes of territory in Syria and Iraq, posted videos of themselves burning their French, Belgian, German or UK passports. France 24 has a team on the ground for what could be the final days of the so-called caliphate in eastern Syria. Paris's official policy had up to now been, we'll take back the children, but male and female insurgents must face charges where crimes were committed. Now that policy is set for something of a reversal. First, there was a Belgian court last month ordering the repatriation of six children with their two Belgian-born mothers, this from Kurdish-controlled Syria. Now, the French interior minister admits the upcoming U.S. pullout in Syria is a game-changer. Paris prefers to take in and incarcerate captured French insurgents who want to return rather than let them roam free. Christophe Castaner would not comment on the reported figure of some 130 returnees, but it does raise the question of their status. Can they ever belong again to the native land that they've renounced? Today in the France 24 debate, what happens when the so-called caliphate falls? And uh, we're joined by Syrian activist Assad al achi executive director of the advocacy group Beitna Syria. Uh, based in Gaziantep, just just over the border in Turkey. Right. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome back Asiam El Defriawi, fellow at the Berlin-based Candid Foundation think tank. Uh, welcome to the show again. Thank you. And uh, from Manchester, retired diplomat Peter Ford, former UK ambassador to Syria. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Go to jail or die, that's how one French national sees her options. She claims she's from Tours in the center of France. She spoke to France 24's James Andre. Civilians continue to pour out of the Islamic State's collapsing caliphate. They are fleeing the fighting, the bombing, and the hunger. Amongst these women, a number of jihadi brides who traveled from all over the world to live under the Sharia. This woman is French. She says her name is Mathilde, that she has no children, and that she lived in the French city of Tours before traveling to Syria four years ago. In all, we could speak to her for 15 minutes. 
What do you hope is going to happen now? <laughs> Are you sad that it's over? No, no, pardon. No. Ça fait longtemps que j'essaie de partir d'ici, mais sans argent, sans connaissance, c'est pas possible. Mathilde says there is still a number of French nationals inside what's left of the so-called caliphate. Je sais qu'il y en a parce que quand on marche, ça, j'entends les Français parler, mais je sais absolument pas. Je sais pas. C'est des gens qui, qui veulent qui veulent pas aller en prison, donc. Euh... C'est soit vous partez et vous êtes à peu près sûr de finir en prison, soit vous restez et vous êtes à peu près sûr de mourir. Donc il y en a qui ont fait le choix, moi j'ai fait le choix d'aller en prison, il y en a qui ont fait le choix de mourir. Death of a prison, a choice she says her husband made, an Egyptian national she married in Syria. Il travaille dans le médical, il travaille dans les hôpitaux, mais c'est pas un combattant. Why did he decide to stay inside if he's not a fighter? Parce qu'il sait très bien qu'il va finir en prison et il veut pas aller en prison. On en a parlé plusieurs fois longuement et il m'a dit moi je peux pas aller en prison. Mathilde says she was disappointed with her life in the caliphate, but never explicitly condemns ISIS crimes or ideology. En France j'étais pas libre parce que j'étais musulmane et je pouvais pas pratiquer comme je voulais. Dans l'État islamique, on peut pratiquer mais faut pratiquer comme. Eux. Vous voyez ce que je veux dire Et si j'avais su, je serais pas, je serais jamais venu ici. Je savais pas que c'était comme ça. Mais je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de personnes qui savaient pas que c'était comme ça. Je dis pas que c'est c'est horrible. On m'a rien fait là-bas. On m'a pas touché. On m'a pas torturé. On m'a pas frappé. On m'a très très bien. Mais c'est pas c'est pas c'est pas ce que je suis But when you came, there were already the videos, the executions, the terrorist attacks. Non, je suis bien avant. Je suis avant les attentats. Do you regret coming here? How do you feel about all this today? Fatigue. Très fatigue. Mathilde explains her first husband persuaded her to go to Syria, but stayed in France. Il est jamais venu ici, mais c'est lui qui m'a envoyé ici. Du coup, ils m'ont jugé en même temps, sans que je sois sur le territoire français, ils m'ont jugé. Moi, je suis déjà jugé et condamné. Who is your husband? What were you sentenced to in France? Do you know? Ouais, ils m'ont condamné à 10 ans de prison dans deux tiers de sursis. What were you sentenced for? Pas pour terrorisme, je suppose. The French government is in no hurry to repatriate jihadists. Mathilde knows it. She says she wants to serve her time in France. Nous, en tant que femmes, on fait. Je suis désolée, là-bas, par faire à manger, le, le ménage, la cuisine, on, on, voyons, on, nous, on va pas au combat, on fait rien. On fait, enfin, on, physiquement, on fait rien, vous voyez ce que je veux dire Après, ça va être des idées, ça va être des, idées des pensées que le, le gouvernement va pas aimer. Mais on, nous, celles qui veulent retourner en France, c'est pas pour commettre des attentats, c'est pas pour aller tuer je sais pas qui dans un supermarché. Nous, si on veut rentrer, c'est pour essayer de retrouver une vie normale. The Kurdish authority is overwhelmed by this continuous influx of foreign jihadists. Countries must repatriate their citizens and judge them. We don't have the resources to put people on trial. There is an alternative via the United Nations. They could create a special tribunal here. Then these people would be judged here, officially. In France, jihadi brides are considered a security threat, and politicians fear public backlash over their return. To the Kurds, these women and their children are both a problem and a major bargaining chip on the international scene. And that uh, report by James Andre. Um, Asim El Difraoui, what are the chances in a typical case for someone like that woman? of being rehabilitated, if you were, of ever getting a normal life again? 
we're not doing a guessing game here, you know. I mean, no, it's imp- I know it's I mean, impossible like, you know, to tell like, with know, I mean, case, like, but um, what, 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 know, how much of a security risk? Okay, let me start differently. You know, I mean, um, there's no alternative to um, trying to rehabilitate those people um, in programs which have so far called be de-radicalization programs. Um, we can't do um, French or European Guantanamo. So as this lady was explaining, um, she was sentenced to prisons already in absentia, and now um, she's going back to France, uh, most likely serve a quite long prison term, but um, she'll be free at some stage. So what do you do with people? Um, I mean, it's, this, it's, it's this, this very, very delicate balance between our security needs and our um, democratic needs, you know? I mean, um, um, those people will leave prison and what to do next? So, I mean, you need to work with them, you need to work on them, as to say, with quite complex um, programs to try to integrate those people um, back into society so that they're not become again a high security risk. Can de-radicalization programs work? It, they work. They work. They don't, what do you I mean, do? They're hardened jihadists. You know, it's, it, it's often very individual programs. So first of all, you look at the causes for radicalization. So there are several causes, several sets of causes. They might be psychological. They're obviously ideological, um, which includes religion. There are a lot of geopolitical reasons, socioeconomic reasons, a perceived feeling of exclusion. Um, but also, um, if we talk about psychology, they're really um, people um, who have a strong affinity towards violence, who went there, I mean, including women, really to um, to be violent, um, to to live their innermost and their worst kind of feeling. So um, um, it's a very individual thing. Those people need to be followed at some stage um, by classical social workers, by psychologists. Um, somebody needs to do very classical rehabilitation programs and so on. It's a very costly process as well. So um, a lot of European government was outstating so officially prefer that those people stay there. And let's not forget that the French defense minister at some stage preferred to kill jihadists, European jihadists in France, that we don't have to deal with this highly complicated issues when people come back to Europe. Yeah, up to now, a French policy has been to accept children, but not jihadis themselves. And back in 2017, the Wall Street Journal even reported that the French had discreetly enlisted Iraqi soldiers to hunt and kill radicalized French nationals in Iraq. Uh, Now comes the U.S. withdrawal from Syria. French cable news channel BFM says there are more or less 130 French nationals the government is willing to take in. The interior minister wouldn't be drawn on the numbers, but did signal a shift in position. The Americans are pulling out of Syria. At the moment, there are people in prison and they're kept there because the Americans are there. So they're going to be freed. They're going to want to return to France. I want all those who come back to be shown justice immediately. We know who these women and men are. They'll be put on trial straight away to be judged and punished. That was the interior minister in the morning. Later in the day, the foreign ministry putting out a statement saying, we're examining all options to prevent the escape and dispersion of these potentially dangerous people. If the forces that have French fighters under their guard took the decision to expel them to France, those fighters would immediately be brought to justice. Assad al just how would it work from those areas in northeast Syria? How do you bring those jihadis uh, to, to those insurgents to France, well, how do you'd have to go through Turkey, right? There are two routes, really, either through Turkey or through the or through the Kurdistan regional regional government. Um, what, up obviously, to, up to uh, to where to Iraq from Iraq from Erbil from Erbil. You would, from Erbil you would fly them you would fly them to France um, or via Turkey. Um, the precedents that have happened so far have happened through Turkey, but they were from the northwest of the country, not from the northeast. Let's not forget that Turkey's intervention in Tur- uh, intervention in Syria, military intervention, started with the cleaning of Jarablus Bab and, and Rai, the three Daesh pockets in the northwest of the country, and there they caught several foreign fighters, and a, a lot of these foreign fighters have been repatriated to their homelands, wherever that is, or sent elsewhere in, in inside Syria. So there are precedents via Turkey. I don't I don't know of any precedents via the Kurdistan regional government, but it is feasible. Um, it can be negotiated, uh, but it's not an easy obviously thing to do. What do you make of this French pivot? Are the, are, are the French right to say, well, now we want to 
take them back? Well, obviously, when, when President Trump announced that he's withdrawing his forces from Syria, uh, the first reaction of the Syrian Democratic Council, which is the political arm of the Syrian Democratic Forces, was saying, well, we can't protect and we cannot maintain the, the security of the Ayn Isa camp, which is the main camp where those foreign fighters are being held at the moment. So they actually indirectly threatened to release all of these foreign fighters inside Syria. And that created, obviously, fear of Daesh regrouping and reestablishing itself elsewhere, whether inside Syria or, or outside. So obviously, priorities change and therefore policy change uh, from that perspective, driven by this, this American decision to withdraw troops. Uh, Peter Ford, just tell us, what is right now the policy in the UK? Uh, for the moment, at least, uh, the UK is uh, resisting by all methods possible. Uh, the return of uh, jihad is making a, a number of uh, excuses. Um, there seems to be a, a firm policy not to go down the path on which France is now embarked. And is that a good or a bad thing? I think uh, it's a, a good thing because what should be happening here is that these are people who committed crimes in Syria and their victims were mostly other Syrians. They should be handed over for justice to the Syrian administration, which is now gradually re-extending its control over the areas where these jihadis are now being captured. Well, they're uh, not in northeast know. Syria yet. And in fact, if President Erdogan has its, his way, it'll be the Turks uh, coming, the, coming into that part of the country, not uh, the, the central government in Damascus. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that is most unlikely to, to happen. Uh, Turkey is only interested anyway in occupying or having some proxy occupy a band 20 miles deep. Uh, Turkey would be way too overextended to come down to the Abu Kamal, Hajin uh, area, Deir Zor, which is uh, 100 kilometers from the Turkish border. Uh, this, this is not uh, serious. Uh, no, uh, the, the way forward is, uh, is clear. The, the Kurds are now in deep discussions uh, with Damascus uh, on the return of Syrian government control to these areas, and that will be a good thing from every point of view. The pacification of these areas, dealing with the sleeper cells, which are much more important than this handful of jihadi, uh, many of them uh, women and children, the sleeper cells represent a, a much greater threat, uh, especially to Syria itself and, and Iraq. All right, so Peter Ford putting the, uh, putting the premise forward that it's, uh, they, they committed crimes in Syria, they should be tried in Syria. Sam al Yeah, it's a very interesting proposition. I mean, um, handing terrorists over to a terror regime, <laughs> um, which was largely responsible for the emergence of jihadism in Syria by liberating hundreds of jihadis at the beginning of the Syrian uprising. I think this is something um, the French wouldn't like to have. You know, no European would like to have that, except totally pro-Assad uh, terror regime guys. But um, the issue is, um, is a wider one. So let me try to summarize. So if the French government is saying for Iraq, um, I mean, there were a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, foreign fighters in Iraqi custody. There we have a legitimate state, you know, um, um, especially in the Kurdish autonomous areas in northern Iraq, you know, there's no death penalty. People can be tried over there. So that's a totally understandable position for European governments to say, okay, they need to be tried on the place. But concerning the Kurdish areas, for example, in um, Syria, contrary to Iraq, you know, there are um, civil war areas, there's no legitimate government, um, the Kurdish militia is controlling the areas, certainly working with, um, with um, the United States at some stage, but there's no legitimate state who can try those people. And we don't know whether this Kurdish enclave uh, persists, but handing them back um, um, to the Assad terror regime will create such an outrage that it's not feasible. But I, I think the gentleman has well, I mean, we've all seen the practices of, of the Assad regime over the past seven years. We've all read the amnesty reports about what the practices in Sydney prison, the industrial scale torture, the, crematory, the crematorium that was recently discovered uh, in Sydney, et etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I mean, it, it, it amazes me that we would hand over these terrorists, as, exactly as you said, to a terrorist regime itself that would further... 
uh, create that vicious circle of, of terror. You will only be feeding the machine. You'll be creating more terrorists by handing over these terrorists to a terrorist regime. That was the root cause, mm. uh, one of the root causes, not yeah. the only root cause, but one of the root causes of the emergence uh, of Daesh, exactly as you said, with the release of several um, Islamic uh, extremists at the beginning of the uprising. All right, when we come back, we're going to see another one of uh, James Andre's exclusive reports showing how many of those insurgents, well, they prefer to uh, die where they're fighting rather than be captured. Stay with us. You're watching a special edition of the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and we're asking uh, what's going to happen when uh, ISIS uh, loses its last territory in the northeast Syria. We have a team on the ground. We'll show you uh, the state of the fighting there. With us to talk about it, Syrian activist Assad al achi executive director of the advocacy group Baitna Syria. Baitna Syria means our house? Is that Correct. What, what does your group do? So basically, we... Uh we try to support projects in areas under control of the moderate opposition um, related to good governance and uh, and human rights, the upholding of human rights. We also advocate for the rights of the Syrian people generally um, interna at the international level. All right. Based out of Gaziantep in Turkey, uh, with us as well, Asiyam El Difrawi, fellow at the Berlin-based Canted Foundation think tank. And uh, from Manchester, retired diplomat Peter Ford, former UK ambassador uh, to Syria. Welcome back to you. With ISIS-held territory reduced to, to nearly naught, it's now a question of where to next for many. As our team discovered firsthand in eastern Syria's Deir el-Zor province, the answer is nowhere. Despite heavy losses, the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, are tightening the noose around what is left of the Islamic State group's so-called caliphate. For Barros, who commands this front line, the last jihadists are also the toughest. Two kilometers forward, a unit is stuck. A jihadist and his wife have entrenched themselves in a house. They have already killed two SDF fighters and refused to surrender. <laughs> A night of fighting begins. The next morning, the SDF take us to the scene. These fighters took part in the assault. They tell us both the husband and the wife were fighting. They say the woman was extremely aggressive. We were unable to confirm the IS militant's nationality. 
القيادة اجت هون والرفاق اجوا لقوا بطاقات بجيوبهم قالوا على احرى فرنسية يعني اخذوها وراحوا قد ما نعرف فرنسية مو فرنسية بس هي جنسية اجنبية يعني ما هي ف... ما هي عربية We ask commanders to confirm but they have yet to reply The man's shoes are from a popular French brand but they're available in many countries We didn't get a chance to investigate any further. Three Daesh fighters have just been spotted right near the position we were in. We have to go straight away because they have entered the tunnel network and we do not know where they will be coming out. As we reach safety, we spot a coalition drone in the sky above us. In the distance, bombers pound the Islamic State's last stronghold. Your reaction when you when you watch that report to uh, what's going on in those final pockets that still have uh, Islamic State fighters? Well, I mean, there are four square kilometers um, still under control of the Islamic State uh, from the S from the SDF side, from the Syrian Democratic Forces side. But what we're forgetting is that in, in the other part of Deir Zor that is under regime control, there is a small pocket still under Di under Daesh control, and there's nothing being done about that. I mean, there are no uh, military um, or kinetic activity, at least at the moment. So although that four square kilometers that are still left at the hand of, of Daesh from the, from the east of the Euphrates, so from the SDF side, might be taken over hopefully soon, the Daesh threat is not over. We still have that pocket that is still in regime-held Deir Zor, and of, obviously we still have the fighters that are still there. Mm -hmm. and, and what we don't know as well is how the Syrian regime is dealing with the fighters that it is catching by clearing uh, territory from from Daesh where are they what are they doing to them are they and where are being where are they being held these are like mm -hmm. quite important questions to answer to be able to see if that group will be able to ever regroup again or rebrand itself under something different mm -hmm. or even infiltrate the northwest of the country and make the Hayat Tahrir sham problem even like 10 times worse than it is already. Peter Ford, how actively is the government in Damascus taking on that last pocket in the desert of uh, northeast Syria? Uh, extremely. Look at the track record of Syria with uh, Russian and Iranian allies. They have cleared uh, ISIS from huge, huge areas of Syria, much bigger than the area uh, cleared by the coalition uh, forces, and more effectively, and taking less time to do it. So I'm afraid your other speaker shows his uh, bias by his comment. Uh, but what is uh, happening is that many of the uh, Daesh fighters have gone underground in all over uh, Syria, and it's the government of Syria that will have to bear the brunt now. We in, in the West, France, Britain, are very self-centered, worrying about 100, 200 of these jihadis who might be coming in our direction. The government of Syria has to deal with possibly tens of thousands who are in sleeper cells. Uh, your other guests uh, seem very tender towards these jihadis, uh, wondering if they will be given proper justice uh, in Syria. Uh, believe me, they will be dealt with appropriately. As him as far. Yeah, I'm a little shocked. I think it's an I'll don't um, I'll use the words. I think um, what the gentleman just said it is a disgrace for a former British diplomat <laughs> lobbying for a terror regime who was one of the root causes of the problem. Obviously, people will go underground. So that's a huge problem for Iraq as well. I mean, there are people roaming in the desert. Um, apparently, like Western intelligence knows about huge stacks of money and weapons in the desert, which is um, constitutes the largest, largest part um, of um, Iraq 
and parts of Syria. Because this morning and the French interior minister said, we know where all our nationals are. Is he telling the truth when he says that? the ones that are the, the, the French jihadists? They might, the most of them might be accounted for. I mean, there has been intelligence before. I mean, French special forces have been active, not only in identifying jihadist areas, they have also actively trying to kill major French jihadi leaders in Iraq and Syria. But I would like to come to back to something else which was just stated. Iran, Russia, and Syria, this fantastic coalition, um, did much more to defeat jihadism than everybody else occurred or the Iraqis, or the Americans, or the French, which is totally untrue, at least what, is, what um, um, happened in the beginning of the Syrian uprising. All these groups, all these nations, fought the liberal elements of Syrian oppositions and made die strong. There was, in fact, a de facto coalition between the Syrian government and the jihadis. Let's both fight. Um, the liberal, progressive, and somehow democratic opposition in Syria. Only when those were defeated, which was a real threat for the Assad regime, and the progressive Syrians, then Syria turned on fighting the jihadis. And, and the, uh, um, also getting it from another quarter is Turkey at a speech delivered Monday in Istanbul. It was clear that Turkey's president had not watched France 24's uh, reporting on the SDF fighting ISIS. Groups of IS terrorists are being armed and trained by YPG terrorists against our country. I hope in the coming days we will defeat and sweep away those remaining IS fighters who were deliberately left in the region and who were armed against our country. So ISIS is being funded by the and, tra and trained, armed and trained by the YPG, says says Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Your, your reaction to that when we saw clearly the opposite in that report. Well, I'm not going to get into the intricacies of Turkish uh, policy towards towards uh, the Kurds in general, but of course it's widely known and widely acknowledged that the PYD or the YPG, their armed, their armed wing, is linked directly or indirectly to the PKK, which is considered a terrorist organization, not only by Turkey, but most most of the Western world. So there are links to the PKK that can be confirmed. Now, the links to the ISIS is probably a bit of an extrapolation, uh, to say the least. Uh, and uh, of course, the, um, the Syrian Democratic Forces have been um, very um, efficient now, in, in, the, in their Syrian fight. Now, Democratic of, Force, I, I, just a reminder of viewers, it's right. a coalition, right? It, it is a coalition of the YP, uh, The backbone of the Syrian Democratic Forces is made of the YPG, which is the military arm of the PYD, which is a Kurdish political party um, established in the northeast of the country. Mm. Uh, but also it includes Arab, Arab forces, um, including um, local uh, forces from Raqqa and from Deir Zor. So, so our, it is a coalition. And our own Wasim Nasser, who follows uh, what's, what's being said about this, says that um, some of the Arabs fighting, they don't want this protracted for too long because uh, the, 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 fi the fighting to go on too long in, in northeast Syria. At what point does the SDF start to, well, perhaps uh, come well, undone? Obviously, that's the biggest risk at the moment is um, for this, especially with the role of the American forces, is, is for this uh, coalition of, of Arab forces and Kurdish forces to fall apart, not only, even more dangerously, uh, more dangerously to start fighting. Uh, it's uh, th for them to start fighting each other. We have precedents. For example, I'll give just a, a very quick example of Liwat Thwar Raqqa, which is, was part of and still is part of the Syrian Democratic Forces. They have had skirmishes with the YPG before, uh, and that might degenerate in, in case there isn't a, a, a certain mission that unites them. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I guess the fight against Daesh is what is ke keeping uh, the ranks for everyone. But there is a big risk once this fight is over mm -hmm. and um, American and, troops and withdraw for them to turn against each other. The, 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 um, the, um, the Arabs, um, which are now allied with the Kurds, won't accept prolonged um, exactly. Kurdish, um, Kurdish control about basically a majority Arab cities. So there's a huge potential so for tension. So going forward, and Peter Ford mentioned he's correct, that there have been talks in Damascus between 
uh, the, the government representatives and, and the different clans uh, in the last few days. Going forward, what's the objective for the Kurds? What's the objective for the Arabs? No, the, the Kurds um, definitely want to preserve some autonomy um, in terms of Kurdish heartlands in Syria and therefore try to find arrangements with um, the dictatorship in Damascus. The Arabs, on the other hand, it's, it's more difficult to see how they find arrangements with Damascus because, I mean, Sunni Arabs mainly started this large-scale uh, rebellions against Assad, so it's very, very delicate. So the Arabs might not only get upset with um, with um, with the Kurds at some stage, um, but also with um, the Western support, which initially propped them up and saying, "Now, okay, now we leave you to Assad." So it's a very, very delicate situation in this multi-ethnic, multi-coalition, um, uh, multi-foreign power intervention strife happening in Syria. So, so the negotiations between the Syrian Democratic Council, which is the political arm of the Syrian Democratic Forces, and the Syrian regime have been ongoing for a while. I mean, the resumption. The, soon, the possible resumption of these negotiations soon is not something new. Um, in over summer, uh, some of these negotiations happened, but they fell apart. Obviously, the Syrian, the Syrian regime and its mentality cannot um, as, um, take into consideration this, the legitimate aspi aspirations of any people, not only the Kurdish aspirations, but also the, the, the local aspirations of the people of Raqqa and Deir Zor. And they're not being able to accommodate the different uh, um, the different interests uh, of, of, uh, of these constituents. Uh, what is very interesting is the way Damascus dealt with these delegations. They were received by Ali Mamluk, and that's it. So they only negotiated with Ali Mamluk, which is, a, which is the, um, the head of the security um, forces or the security intelligence. What does that tell you? Um, uh, that tells me that Damascus only looks at the Kurdish issue from a security from a security lens, but not from an economic integration, uh, social uh, lens uh, at large. Peter Ford, you agree? I totally disagree. It's hard to know where where to start. Uh, I try to deal with facts, uh, not propaganda. Uh, the, uh, the Arab uh, tribes will welcome the return of the Syrian administration because they don't like being dominated by the, the Kurds uh, and they don't like their American overlords. Uh, the, the Americans don't dare to, to visit some of the Arab villages. Uh, it's no wonder there are so many ISIS sleeper cells because there are no go areas in those Arab tribal uh, areas. Uh, all this will come to an end when Damascus re-establishes its control and we return to this situation which obtained before all the trouble broke out in 2011, which was not so very terrible. Well, I mean, I, I don't necessarily completely disagree with what Ambassador Ford just said. Um, of course, Damascus is investing in tribal differences um, in, in these areas. I can give the example of the differences between the Shaitat and the Baggara. And I can go on and on about, especially in Deir Zor, what Damascus has been doing, Not even more important, it's not really Damascus who's been doing it, it's Iran, and how much Iran has been investing in empowering different tribes to attack other uh, tribes and, and along, along tribal fault lines. This has been ongoing um, pretty much since 2011, but has, it has exasperated ever since the Syrian uh, regime has established some of its control west of the Euphrates in the Deir Zor, in the Deir Zor area and, and in, in invested a lot in, in, in these tribal uh, structures. Uh, so, of course, some of the tribes would like to see uh, Damascus back, but the overall mood uh, when we speak to our contacts in Raqqa, for example, uh, or our colleagues uh, that are there, it's uh, it's fear. It's sheer fear of what's next. The moment President Trump announced that uh, he's withdrawing his forces, they they felt abandoned and they felt left alone to fate to their fate uh, between the Turks. And the Syrian regime and the Iranians. For many, the original sin in the region is 2003 when the U.S. decides it wants regime change in Iraq. Now we're having a story about the Americans withdrawing, and yet there's what's being described as element of fear. So are the Americans wanted or not? 
Is there an original sin? Um, yeah, there is an original sin. Um, it's not so much um, invading Iraq and um, um, getting rid of Saddam Hussein. It's the whole aftermath, you know, also the same aftermath we already had in Afghanistan when the Soviets were defeated. No investment, no real presence in terms of development, uh, no real um, engagement in democratic processes, no after war plan. And that's what's going to happen next, you know, again and, and again. Um, um, ISIS is defeated and the Western sin again will be okay. Now let's um, so leave those countries alone. I mean, uh, Trump also wants to pull out of Afghanistan. And we'll have this ungovernable states, I mean, um, where, um, where um, not only total corruption reigns, you know, also another factor which encourages jihadism. And do, Europeans, but also jihadism. do Europeans get it? Because we saw the, what happened when the Americans empowered these Arab tribes uh, in Iraq. This was then very they, helpful, but then they stopped. Then they, then they stopped, and no, we saw I mean, the let's, results let's, of that. Let's, let's, Have Europeans learned that lesson? Let's, well, do you think let's, they'll let's, be let's more Let's face invested? it. Um, there's also with the European um, beer a large part of the blame, a brunt of the blame. Um, Europe, Europe is a... Um, toothless tiger, in a sense. Um, I mean, if we look at this conflict in Syria, you know, we should really um, think about how to develop a European military power, how to be um, able um, to conduct complex uh, um, operations, peacekeeping operations, but also rapid intervention without the Americans, you know. There is some progress, even Merkel um, running a German government, which committed to pacifism much more than most other European um, governments. Um, is um, engaged in talks, or um, at least stated, um, that we need to have more European military power. All right, we'll, le we'll leave it there. Uh, I want to thank you, Asim Al-Difraoui. I want to thank as well Assad al achi I want to thank Peter Ford for being with us uh, from Manchester. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. Enter Simon Harding. How are you? Good evening, Francois. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very well, thank you. Obviously, Syria has been in the news today because of the French government's announcement that it may repatriate 130 suspected uh, ISIS members. It's, of course, been uh, taken upon very heavily by social media and the press. We can start here with an article in The Telegraph, which was headlining on that, and, of course, going into the details of what that might entail mm -hmm. politically as well as internationally and domestically. Um, we have a first reaction from Gérard Arraud, the uh, um, French ambassador in the United States, who, of course, we know what, how tough Donald Trump's policy is on terrorism. So perhaps this tweet just simply saying, if they are jihadists, they will be indicted when back in France, perhaps simply just to reassure his American allies. Um, this article in the New York Times, um, Kurdish fighters discuss releasing almost 3,200 ISIS prisoners, actually dates back to December, but it's a very interesting read because it gives um, some background information on why this situation is how it is at the moment. Leverage, Assad? Absolutely. And then we, we go into more reactions here. Nadim Harim from Human Rights Watch, which who says it's the correct decision, the position of France, um, which it previously occupied in Syria, was untenable. And those who have committed crimes need to be judged for society. Children need to be reintegrated. So that's also a multifaceted problem mm. that is arising from this issue. Yeah, we didn't. We haven't discussed really what to do about the children who've been living there for for years now. And so well, that's, that's one of the major um, concerns to all European governments at this stage. Yeah. A tremendous concern. Not to speak about the children, who the, the hundreds of thousands of children who have been living under ISIS rule and have been indoctrinated. I'll come back to Marine Le Pen in just a minute, but because we're touching upon children, obviously um, our colleagues at Le Monde uh, published this article saying Paris doesn't exclude a return of the jihadists, but that just simply means that there are other options on the table, including this one, which was published in The Independent, of course, France to repatriate children of jihadi fighters, but then to leave the families behind. So that would mean, of course, separating them from their parents. It's a very difficult issue, as you were mentioning, in which, again, involves a lot of, of legal parameters. Um, coming back to Marine Le Pen, as you would expect, she was very quick to react, saying, um, quoting uh, Christophe Castaner here, saying, ce sont d'abord uh, des Français, they are first French before being jihadists. And she is saying, no, they are jihadists and therefore should not be French. 
Bangladesh anymore. With the, the whole question of do you take away passports uh, from people and leave them uh, absolutely. stateless? Absolutely. Yeah. The chance de nationalité, I, yeah. I believe it, it's called in French. And uh, this viewer is actually from the United States, and, and she was simply saying, if you repatriate them, OK, but will that mean that there is more radicalization in French prisons? which is, of course, where a lot of this happens in the first place, this homegrown terrorism. Briefly, is, what's the answer to that? Yes, no? Yeah, more rehabilitation politics, yeah. But we need to get these people back also to show that we're real democracies, you know. Um, this is a very powerful argument against jihadis. We have a rule of law, we judge people, we don't kill people which is um, a very, very powerful counter-narrative to all this jihadi propaganda. Not but only, it's a huge challenge. It's not huge not challenge. only to jihadi propaganda, but to um, Assad's Assad's dictatorship pro yeah. pro propaganda, like the, the, the Assad propaganda as well. Well, what, what's certain is that, at least on social media for now, there is a lot of opposition to that because of perhaps everything that's been in the press about it being so grown in the prison. Uh, Tor Hamming is a scholar and he also believes that this is a big step in the right direction, perhaps echoing what you guys are saying about really trying to cure this um, at home first and foremost. Valérie Boyer, who is a, a Re Les Républicains a, a member of Parliament... Conservative member. Exactly, saying um, that 500 individuals uh, in France will be, 10% uh, of them should be released in 2019, and now that they are learning that 130 other jihadists will be arriving, so a very sarcastic comment, um, very critical of the president's decision. And just finally, um, to take it a bit further, Jonathan Beale, who is the BBC's defence correspondent, saying French government says French jihad is captured to prevent them from escaping, change of policy that may add pressure on UK, which has so far resisted taking any of its foreign fighters back. So, of course, this is pointing to the fact that perhaps other countries might follow suit, might choose to change their policy to find a lasting solution to the problem front side. But, of course, it's all up in the air. All up in the air for now. Simon Harding, I want to thank you. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank, thank you. you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. Thank you.